Hello, my name is Erin Elliott and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement for the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Thank you for tuning in to this faculty mini college recording session, highlighting U of M faculty from different schools and colleges talking about their research. Each year, the university holds two mini college events in Naples, Florida and Phoenix, Arizona. Mini College is a half-day, lifelong learning opportunity that features presentations from expert faculty from around the U. Mini College is a partnership with the university schools and colleges, the Alumni Association, and the University of Minnesota Foundation. George was selected as the keynote speaker for the Mini College in Arizona this year. It is my pleasure to welcome George Weibland to present The Cannabis Conundrum, The Science and Politics of America's Most Controversial Plant. George Weiblin is a distinguished McKnight University professor in the Department of Plant Biology in the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota, where he has been a member of faculty since 2001. He also serves as an herbar herbarium curator for the University's Bell Museum of Natural History. Weiblin studies plant and insect systematics, populations genetics, ecology, and coevolution. His lab focuses on combining field research in tropical and temperate ecosystems by studying the ecology and evolution of plant-insect interactions via specimen-based research and DNA sequencing. sequencing. George is also the few researchers permitted by the federal government to study the genetics of cannabis and his research challenges opinions on all sides of the public debate about marijuana. George, welcome to the presentation. Thank you, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here with plants at the university where we have a proposal to build a new conservatory on the St. Paul campus where we'll conserve plant diversity. We're particularly interested in combating plant blindness, the widespread phenomenon that many people just simply take plants in nature for granted. And we use facilities like the Bell Museum and the conservatory to reconnect students and the public to our natural world. And the topic that I'm going to talk about today, cannabis, is an excellent topic for uh, co connecting, uh, connecting the public to, uh, uh, to plants, because this is a plant that is of great public interest for a variety of reasons. I'm going to review the ethnobotany of cannabis today, that is uh, the uh, relationship between people and this plant. I'm going to talk about my research on the genetic basis of uh, variation within cannabis, uh, particularly hemp and marijuana, uh, which are members of the same species. And then I'll talk about some of the future research directions that my lab is, is now undertaking. So as you may know, uh, cannabis is one of the earliest cultivated plants. Uh, here's an image of a, of a medieval woodcut from a German herbal documenting uh, the uh, medicinal properties of this plant. Turns out there's archaeological evidence going back uh, 14,000 years for uh, humans using the plant cannabis. Pretty much every major civilization outside of those in the Americas uh, cultivated cannabis. Uh, ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, Africa, China. In China, the seeds of the plant were a staple grain in ancient China. The stems of the plant are a source of durable fiber uh, for cloth, paper, rope, twine, many other applications. And the dried flowers of the plant have been used as a recreational drug and as medicine throughout the world for millennia. Cannabis first came to the Americas with European colonists who introduced it as a fiber crop. And in fact, the founding fathers uh, grew cannabis on their plantations George Washington and Thomas Jefferson cultivated hemp. Where uh, here are shown some some propaganda pieces from the 1930s referring to marijuana as the assassin of youth and reefer madness, uh, a dangerous drug capable of uh, inducing uh, 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 immoral uh, and uncontrolled behavior. It was in 1937 that the Marijuana Tax Act for the first time uh, prohibited the uh, uh, production, sale, and use of marijuana in the United States. Now what we're talking about when uh, we refer to marijuana and marijuana laws are basically the female flowers. Uh, cannabis is a plant with male and female flowers on different 
different individual plants in the population. And it is the female plants that have uh, very dense uh, flower clusters that uh, contain microscopic hairs. And here you're seeing an image of a scanning electron micrograph showing these tiny mushroom-shaped structures, which are multicellular glandular hairs. Now, a gland is an organ that secretes something. Uh, plants have glands just as animals have sweat glands. Plants have glandular hairs into which they secrete substances. In the case of cannabis, these are phytochemicals uniquely produced just by cannabis plants that are secreted into these globe-shaped structures at the tip of the hair. And the primary uh, the primary phytochemical found in the microscopic hairs of cannabis is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, or THC, which, uh, when ingested, induces a mild euphoria. Now, uh, it was in the 1960s when uh, marijuana was adopted as a political symbol uh, that signified a uh, rejection of societal norms uh, in America. Uh, Dr. Timothy Leary encouraged uh, young people to turn on, tune in, and drop out. And uh, it was uh, marijuana that was in many ways a, a symbol uh, for a, uh, a generation uh, of, of Americans uh, rejecting societal norms and adopting uh, the use of, of this drug. The federal government in 1970 uh, through the Controlled Substances Act, uh, defined marijuana as any part of the plant cannabis, whether growing or not. Uh, any extract of the plant, basically since uh, 1970, it has not been possible uh, for American farmers to grow the hemp plant, and all cannabis plants have been uh, treated as a drug, whether or not they contain very much of the drug substance itself. There were a couple of products that were exempted from the Controlled Substances Act, uh, one of them being seeds incapable of germination, and this is because hemp seeds have been popular uh, in bird seed mixes. Uh, also, fibers of the plant were exempted uh, from the definition of the drug, recognizing uh, the use of hemp fiber in many applications from rope to paper uh, to cloth. But since 1970, the hemp seed and the hemp fiber have only been available in the United States legally by importation. Now, uh, with uh, the Controlled Substances Act, uh, marijuana uh, uh, became a $25 billion uh, illegal business uh, in the United States during the 1990s with efforts uh, to uh, prosecute marijuana cases leading to uh, over 800,000 Americans criminally charged each year and billions spent on marijuana enforcement. It was uh, a botanist at Harvard, uh, Richard Evans Schultes, who was uh, one of the first uh, plant biologists to study cannabis in detail. And uh, Schultes uh, was an uh, inspiration to a generation of uh, botanists interested in studying uh, drug plants. And uh, he's also uh, famous for having produced the uh, only golden guide to treat illegal substances, the Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants, which uh, was part of the Golden Guide Nature series directed at, at young audiences. And as you can imagine, with the appearance of this book in the early 1970s, it was quickly uh, pulled from publication. But uh, Schultes continued his work uh, studying cannabis around the world. And here he's shown with uh, uh, cannabis plants in Afghanistan uh, and also in Mexico. Uh, in Schultes' gu uh, Golden Guide, uh, 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 marijuana is represented uh, uh, as uh, uh, in, the, in this image here of uh, reefers and manicured marijuana. And at that time, the drug potency was about 2 to 3 percent of the THC. Now, uh, thanks to efforts by uh, marijuana breeders and the uh, marijuana industry, 
the potency of uh, cannabis was increased such that uh, by 2009, uh, much of the cannabis available was more than 20% THC dry weight. So a dramatic increase in potency over this period. It was uh, in 1996 that uh, a California Proposition 215, uh, for the first time in the United States, uh, rejected a federal definition of cannabis and uh, enacted uh, medical marijuana legislation where, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, where California recognized conditions that could be treated with cannabis, including cancer, AIDS wasting, chronic pain, spasticity, glaucoma, and so forth. And what this law did was turn underground pot growers and dealers into caregivers and uh, turn pot smokers who registered with the state into patients. Now, uh, medical marijuana legislation expanded. Other states took it up. But it was Colorado in 2014 that made history for the first time by uh, recognizing that most of the individuals participating in their medical cannabis program were just using the drug recreationally anyway. And so uh, Colorado took this bold move of uh, enacting recreational marijuana laws, uh, treating the substance much like alcohol, tobacco, or uh, any other vice. It was uh, within the first four months of this program that, uh, uh, there, that uh, there were over $200 million in marijuana sales, uh, collecting about $11 million in uh, state sales tax. So uh, we've seen dramatic shifts in the uh, popularity and public policy uh, surrounding cannabis. My research has really focused on uh, how these drug-type cannabis plants and the hemp-type cannabis plants are different. And uh, one thing we can note at the outset is that marijuana plants tend to have high concentrations of the drug THC and hemp plants much less. America hasn't grown hemp, as I mentioned, because these two uh, cultivated plants are members of the same species, and the federal law defines all cannabis plants as illegal drugs regardless of their THC content. But there is a, a growing interest uh, in hemp in the United States, particularly uh, as, a, uh, as a food and dietary supplement. The uh, seeds of the cannabis plant are very rich in oils and protein, uh, and particularly rich in the omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid balance that many people find uh, particularly, uh, particularly attractive as a healthy food. The market for hemp products, particularly uh, hemp butter, hemp seeds, hemp seed oil, surpassed uh, $600,000 in 2015, which is a small market, but it is one that has grown at a rate of 20% a year for some time now. Uh, the fibers of the plant are a renewable alternative to plastics, and if American farmers could grow hemp, it would reduce our dependence on foreign imports. So these are some of the reasons why we might be interested in taking a look at hemp. And in fact, in 2014, the federal government uh, actually passed a bill, quite a remarkable achievement for, um, uh, for Congress at that time. Uh, it was two senators from, the, uh, from tobacco country uh, that introduced uh, industrial hemp uh, legislation that would, for the first time, define industrial hemp as cannabis plants containing less than three-tenths of 1% THC. And that uh, this, um, this act now allows institutions of higher education, like the University of Minnesota, or state departments of agriculture to study industrial hemp. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you about the work that I've been doing uh, with uh, a DEA registration since 2001 uh, on the genetic basis of the difference between hemp and marijuana. And this is where uh, we get into the science. And what we're interested in here is trying to understand uh, the the variation that we see in plants and what component of that variation can be attributed to the genes as opposed to the environment in which the plants are growing. So let's imagine we have two different cultivars, uh, di different 
uh, genetically different uh, uh, members of the same species like hemp and marijuana. If we grow them in the same environment, like at low density, um, we will observe that they have somewhat different appearance. Uh, if we were to take the same cultivars and grow them in different environments, we'd see uh, also differences in appearance. So for instance, if we grew the plants at high density, they might appear uh, less highly branched in both types. Now in our work, what we're interested in doing is disentangling uh, what component of these uh, measurable traits, these uh, qualities of the plant, can be attributed to the genetics as opposed to uh, different environmental conditions. And uh, why we're interested in, in this is so that we can improve plants for agriculture. So uh, let's imagine that some component of uh, the observable characteristics is heritable. In other words, it can be passed on from, uh, from parent to offspring. We can then select upon that component of variation to change uh, the appearance of the population. So if we start out in a first generation uh, where we see variation in plant height and we select uh, uh, seeds produced by individuals in that population, uh, for, uh, we select the individuals that are taller. In our second generation, we'll see on average an increase uh, in the uh, height of plants in that population, provided that plant height does have some genetic basis. And if we were to select over an additional generation, we'll see that uh, we not only increase the average height, but we also uh, reduce the amount of variability we see in the population, such that after three generations, perhaps the plants appear uh, more uniformly taller and uh, more uniform genetically. Now, in the case of cannabis, what we're particularly interested in is understanding how the uh, uh, two major cannabinoids that we see are produced uh, in the plant and what's the genetic basis for that. So as I mentioned, marijuana produces predominantly THC with its associated euphoric effects. The other major cannabinoid, cannabidiol or CBD, is uh, predominantly produced by hemp plants and has non-euphoric effects. It turns out that, that THC and CBD share a common precursor in the biochemical assembly line that uh, results in the uh, production of cannabis. So uh, cannabigerolic acid, or CBG, is converted, is converted molecularly either into THC or into CBD uh, in cannabis plants. And our basic question is, why do the marijuana cultivars produce mostly the THC and hemp cultivars mostly uh, the CBD. Well, after 12 years of underfunded, overregulated research, uh, last year in 2015 we published our paper on genes affecting drug content in cannabis. And it's uh, the results of this study that I will now present with a little background uh, on basic genetics to help orient you. Uh, cannabis, just like our own species, has got two copies of each chromosome in its genome, and each parent contributes uh, one of their copies to the offspring. And just to remind you, these chromosomes are strands of DNA that contain genes, the instructions uh, that underwrite life on Earth. What we did in our study was take advantage of the uh, genetic differences between hemp and marijuana to look at the basis for variation in drug content. So uh, we imported from, from Europe a marijuana strain and from Canada a hemp strain and we crossed uh, hemp with marijuana to produce a hybrid uh, which we'll call uh, the F1 generation, these are the children of the hemp marijuana cross, and then uh, as is the case in classic plant breeding experiments, we then looked at how the, uh, we looked at, at, at the grandchildren of this cross, the F2 generation, uh, to, to then measure the expression of uh, 
cannabinoids in the grandchildren and compare it uh, to uh, their parents and their grandparents. So this uh, is the main data slide that I'm going to focus on uh, in the talk uh, to try to explain uh, the different patterns of cannabinoid variation and the model for how uh, THC and CBD are inherited in cannabis. So we have a plot here of the percentage dry weight of CBD versus uh, the percentage dry weight of THC. And what you'll see uh, parents in our crossing experiment are shown in red. Uh, marijuana parents line up uh, um, along the y-axis here uh, with uh, THC content ranging from 3 to 9 percent and very low but detectable levels of CBD. Whereas uh, the hemp varieties, they um, have, they, the hemp parent uh, express more CBD and very low levels of THC. The hybrids were intermediate, shown by the blue crosses, uh, and the grandchildren fell into three classes, uh, drug-like grandchildren, hemp-like grandchildren, and intermediate grandchildren. And we screened about 500 of these grandchildren, and the numbers of plants falling into each category uh, approximated a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, which is exactly uh, the ratio observed by Czech monk Gregor Mendel, who discovered the laws of simple inheritance by crossing plants back in 1865. And the pattern we saw was consistent with a scenario uh, like what is illustrated here with snapdragons, where you have a red snapdragon and a white snapdragon. You cross them, you get an intermediate hybrid pink snapdragon, and then you look at the grandchildren of that pink, you look at the, the children, the offspring of that pink snapdragon, and you find uh, red to pink to white in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. That is consistent with the idea of a single gene controlling of the uh, THC to CBD ratio, where you know, we recognize that uh, uh, along a chromosome, a specific uh, uh, region on that chromosome contains some instructions, and different individuals can vary in the particulars of those instructions in that particular location. So if we have a gene that, let's say, uh, has different variants, let's call them variants A and B, and one uh, variant A results in THC, uh, variant B results in CBD, if these uh, variations sort independently during, uh, during sexual reproduction in the plant, you can end up with plants that have two copies of A that are high THC, two copies of B that are uh, high CBD, or uh, plants that have one copy of A and one copy of B that produce something intermediate. So could it be that, in fact, the gene controlling the difference between hemp and marijuana is the gene that uh, contains the instructions for the enzymes that do the biochemical uh, do the biochemical work of converting CBD, CBG into either THC or CBD. Could it be that these two enzymes, which are, uh, ha have been uh, discovered by biochemists, happen to be uh, encoded by different alleles of the same gene region? Well, uh, our work showed the story to be a bit more complicated than that. Um, in fact, uh, what we have found is that the genes for THC synthase and CBD synthase, the genes that, that contain the instructions for those enzymes, are present in both hemp and marijuana. And so in our model, uh, there was an ancient cannabinoid synthase gene that underwent a duplication event, and then copies of that gene uh, diverged such that one copy, uh, one copy evolved the function of THCA synthase and the other copy evolved the function of CBDA synthase. Now, um, we used uh, our uh, DNA sequencing uh, technology 
to create the first uh, genetic map for cannabis using uh, small variations in DNA among individuals within that same uh, population that I just described of the hemp and marijuana cross. And what we produced was the first genetic linkage map for cannabis, which uh, basically uh, each of these uh, each of these bars represents a chromosome and marked along it are genetic markers that we identified uh, uh, are linked to one another, meaning they're genetic markers that, that are on uh, the same chromosome. And we were able to also uh, map the genes for THCA synthase and CBDA synthase uh, and include that in our genetic map. And it was on uh, it was on linkage group number six that we found uh, the gene for CBDA synthase and the gene for THC synthase, uh, synthase are very tightly linked. They're very close together on the same chromosome. And then when we look at the, um, the measurable drug content in plants, we find that in fact we can, uh, we can explain a very high proportion of the uh, THC to CBD ratio uh, by that very specific region on linkage group number six. No other linkage group in our map can explain uh, the variation in the THC uh, to CBD ratio. So we think that uh, the, the genetic difference is mapped to the same location where there are duplicated genes in, uh, in cannabis. It, now if you look at the, the DNA sequences for THC synthase and CBD synthase. This is where we found something completely unexpected. Uh, many have proposed that uh, variation in the, uh, in the gene for, uh, for THC synthase might be responsible for producing more or less uh, THC or CBD. And in fact, uh, we did see genetic variation among uh, marijuana and hemp in the THC A and uh, uh, synthase gene region. However, it's actually the CBDA synthase that accounts for the major difference. We found uh, in our marijuana strain a deletion of uh, some of the genetic code and it is the deletion uh, mutation that we see in marijuana that we think explains the major difference in, in uh, drug content between marijuana and hemp. And to understand how, we need to review a little bit of molecular biology. The fact that the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA gets translated into uh, amino acids forming proteins, which are uh, enzymes like uh, the cannabinoid synthases. When you have a deletion mutation in the gene, uh, it can transpire that when uh, the RNA is being transcribed into protein, uh, that process is interrupted and interrupted prematurely and, and, the, uh, and a functional protein is not produced. And so in fact, uh, what we are seeing is that this deletion in the marijuana strains knocks out the production of CBDA synthase. So hemp produces a functional CBDA synthase enzyme whereas marijuana doesn't. So uh, to tie together the biochemistry uh, with the results of our crossing study, uh, we uh, propose that hemp is not marijuana because marijuana lacks the enzyme that preferentially makes CBD. Now if you think about THC synthase and CBD synthase competing for this common precursor, if they were equally competitive for, for that same precursor molecule, we would expect uh, intermediate plants with one copy of each uh, uh, to fall right along this dashed line. That's a one-to-one -one expectation of THC to CBD. But in fact, in our hybrid plants and in our intermediate uh, grandchildren, the uh, the THC to CBD ratio of those of individual plants always falls below the line, which means that uh, CBD synthase is a superior competitor. 
So by knocking out CBD synthase, you produce uh, more THC. And we think that this deletion mutation producing more THC might have been selected uh, during domestication to enhance marijuana potency. Now, uh, just to conclude uh, briefly with uh, some of our current direction, uh, we are looking at, at hemp populations in Minnesota that uh, descend from the old uh, hemp industry. Particularly in the Minnesota River Valley, uh, there are uh, extensive populations of wild, naturalized, or feral hemp. And these are descended from the effort of the U.S. Deplan Defense Plant Corporation during World War II to open hemp mills uh, throughout Minnesota. The U.S. Army distributed hemp seed to Minnesota farmers and opened 11 hemp mills. They did this uh, because the supply of hemp fiber uh, was cut off by the Pacific War and uh, a source of hemp was needed domestically. After 80 generations, uh, the uh, naturalized hemp in Minnesota may have changed uh, genetically in response to our environment, adaptation uh, to the Minnesota environment. So we're interested in going out into these feral populations and acquiring uh, hemp germplasm that's been adapting to our, our local conditions uh, for the purpose of developing a new American hemp variety that might be cultivated should, uh, uh, should, a, uh, should laws uh, be changed. So um, we have a small industry sponsored award to go out and make a seed collection. We uh, developed a research protocol for collecting seed uh, that was approved by DEA in 2015, and that coincided with the passage of the Minnesota Industrial Hemp Development Act of 2015 that uh, brings Minnesota into, the, uh, uh, into alignment with the uh, Federal Agricultural Act of 2014, allowing uh, uh, institutions of higher learning and uh, state, de state departments of agriculture to, uh, to do hemp research. And so on uh, September 23rd of 2015, we uh, ventured out into the field uh, to an undisclosed location in the Minnesota River Valley uh, with our uh, lockbox, a lockable gun safe uh, to contain uh, the feral hemp and transport it to our laboratory where uh, we could study it. And here uh, you see uh, photographs of healthy stands of Minnesota wild hemp uh, which, uh, from which uh, we collected seed that we are now uh, studying in our laboratory in hopes of developing new varieties to meet a domestic, uh, the needs of a domestic uh, hemp industry in the future. Now I just want to conclude by mentioning that uh, it's been very difficult to uh, carry out this research and I'm showing a quote here uh, from a, a peer-reviewed uh, grant proposal where uh, the reviewer uh, concluded that I would simply be blowing smoke rings in the dark, uh, that embarking on this experimental plan is far more ambitious than slinging on a backpack for another six-month hike. Well, um, how do you like that? That is um, the kind of uh, ridicule that uh, cannabis research has uh, received and uh, continues to receive. And uh, uh, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to tell you about the work and thank you for listening and click here to contribute to our lab fund. All right. Well, thank you so much, George. Um, I'm just going to take back presenter here and if you would like to learn about um, ways to stay connected to George's work or the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, please be sure to check out um, these websites listed here. Thank you again for tuning in today.